Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you and from the Op, also known as USAopoly. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 694. W is for winsome. And L is for lose some. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff bakes us some cookies, we answer some questions from the mailbag, and present a new tale of board gaming horror. Then it's U times two with our top 10 games that start with the letter W. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the Wade Watts of board gaming, Tom Vassell. Uh, all right. Two things. First of all, winsome is an actual word. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It means attractive or appealing in appearance or character. Sure. Should be used more often. Um, secondly, I don't really like Wade Watts. No. I know that. So, going back through the podcast history, I'm pretty sure we can find an old episode where you told me I would love Ready Player One. I I I really enjoyed Ready Player One. You... And I enjoyed it to some degree. It was one of those books that I did not enjoy on the rereading as much. And hmm. Ready Player Two. I have. I, I so I bought Ready Player Two. I have not had the opportunity to to read it yet. But hearing about some of the stuff that it focuses on, I'm not nearly as interested in those pop culture references than I was of the stuff that was focused on in Ready Player One. Yeah, but that makes me wonder, Eric, if I just wrote a book full of 80 pop references and just listed a whole bunch in order, would you like the book? I mean, well, um, not necessarily. But that has Uh, been one of the chief criticisms of Ready Player One is it's sort of a list of cool stuff. Um, Yeah. I I think that's why it works well in the first reading because you're like, hey, hey, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And the second time I'm like, I got it. You're you're about to list a bunch of 80s references. (laughs) The movie, the movie, and I'm going to. Take this, everyone. The movie was better than the book. Ooh. My, my son really enjoyed the movie. He, it's one of his favorite movies. He insisted that we get it on home video as soon as it was released. <laughs> did you just say home video? I did. <laughs> All right. <laughs> welcome to the 80s, everybody. Uh, or 90s, I guess. Yeah. All righty. Well, welcome, folks, to the Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. And this is a show all about board games, and we have a tale of horror for you in a little bit. I'm so excited. I actually practiced. Did you really? I did. Well, I got to get the voice back. Well, folks, first of all, I would be remiss. This is the final week for you to uh, participate in the Dice Tower Kickstarter. Um, Dice Tower Kickstarter is how we raise our funds for each year, for each season. This is season 2021. I stopped naming the seasons. Actually, I think I do have a number. Do you? No, maybe not. I think I took it out, I guess. I think actually. you stopped a couple of years ago. I, I, I appreciate that because I was losing track. Yeah. I Okay. Anyhow, um, you can go there and find all sorts of different things and ways to back the Dice Tower. And we appreciate everyone who has already done so. And I just remind you that it ends at midnight or actually technically at 1159 this coming Saturday. Why is it 1159? Okay. Because I'm always really worried that if I put midnight, it might accidentally be noon. Oh, yeah, you never know. You know, and midnight, is midnight that day or is it the following day? Right. You know, it's, I'm, I'm always, I don't know, it's, it's, it's gotten me before. So <laughs> I yeah. just say 11.59. Sure. We're going to be uh, here at the main Dice Hour studio. We'll do a little mini marathon. To celebrate it out, and if you haven't noticed on the Dice Tower channel right now, we're doing our top 100 games of all time. Oh, and fun. if you've watched it, you will have realized that Merchants of Venus is not on my list. Again. Or is it? Or is it? There's still... See, by the time you listen to this, there's still 80 games left. Uh, I'm not holding out hope. You should not. All right. <laughs> <sighs> oh, well... You know what? Uh, and once again, folks, I'd also remind you that this is not the only podcast that we put out at Dice Tower. We also have a, a sister podcast, a smaller podcast called Dice Tower Digest. No, Dice Tower Now. Sorry. Dice Tower Now is our uh, news yes. and just what's going on in the world. 
Our friend Corey is also on the show and talks about all sorts of interesting ideas and things. Hmm. Dice Tower Digest is our newsletter, and if you want to um, get that sent to you, where we send out all the different news from the Dice Tower Network, you can email us at digest at gmail.com. All right, it's time to talk about games. And I'm going to start with a game that I was really looking forward to. It was a Kickstarter yeah. game called Mini Golf Designer. I heard about this. I'm excited to hear what you think. Mini Golf Designer, each player is building a miniature golf course. The basic conceit of the game is very simple. Each round, you have a row of tiles to pick from. So let's say there's five four players in the game, we will have five tiles in a row. The tiles have numbers on the back, so it helps you sort them out in this row. Mm -hmm. Eric goes first. He picks any tile he wants from that row. He can discard it or add it to his mini golf course. When you add tiles to your mini golf course, it's a little like Carcassonne. You have two sides, the the grassy side, and then the side that would connect your little holes to each other, your little Mm -hmm. miniature golf holes, or putt-putt as the... Uh, I can't say putt putt. It always it just sounds so weird. But I when no, I moved down south, putt putt's a brand name, right? No, that's what everyone calls it down south here. Well, I mean, wh- where I grew up, putt putt was a like a brand name. Well, sure, but when I moved down south, I found that everybody called it putt putt. Oh, mm. No one calls it miniature golf down here. That's interesting. Yeah. It's a weird thing. It's like ping pong and table tennis. Or like everybody that calls any carbonated beverage Coke. I'd like a Coke. What kind? Sprite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anywho, so you you so the interesting thing about that is whatever tile you take, Eric, if you take the first tile in line, that means you're going to go first next round. But you put your little marker there to show you picked that tile. Mm-hmm. And sort so of like tiles, King Domino. Yeah, very 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 similar to that okay. actually. And so these these tiles keep rotating, and you're going to keep doing it until uh, one person finishes their golf course. When they finish their golf course, they just start taking a tile every turn which is like worth two points. So everyone's kind of encouraged to finish up. All right. That's the basic part of this game. Now, where the game gets slightly complex is scoring. There is a lot of things to worry about in this. First of all, you want to have exactly nine holes. You can have more, but you'll lose points. You can have less, but you'll lose points. Hmm. You want all your holes to be between par three and par five, because that apparently is some law that they wrote somewhere. Right. Well, you can't make mini golf courses too difficult. That's true. And again, you can do that, but you'll lose points. And also, you even want to have an average of four par on all your holes. So like, okay. if all your holes are par five, that's not good for you. You'll lose some points for that, too. Wow. So do you have to like do the math? No, they do it in a very funky way. They give you, I think, let's see. So it's nine holes times four. You have 36 cubes. And each time you build a hole, you put these cubes on your things from par three to par five. So you put three to five cubes on your thing, or more uh, or less. Okay. So when you run out of cubes, you need to start using black cubes, which are worth negative points. <sighs> it's so fiddly. I would have dropped that from the game completely. Hmm. You know, I don't know how – I know what they were trying to do. But that's not it. There's two people coming to your golf course, a Mr. and a Mrs. Like, each one wants something different. So, like, Mr. Long – Wants you to have holes that are a certain number of tiles long. Mrs. Dog or something. They're, they're named with very obvious names. <laughs> Mrs. You to have, dog? Well, I don't remember what her name is, but there's one lady who wants as many dogs on the course. Maybe her name is Mrs. Terrier. I don't know. Something okay. like that. Yeah, all right. And so you draw those and you score for that. You also need to make sure you, you can walk from hole one to hole two. You want to try to have them in order. You'll get points for that. Hmm. And there's a lot of different ways that points are scored at the end of the game. And that's the basic game. In the advanced game, you can kind of bet on whether you'll win at different categories and stuff. Really? I love the – oh, and also, you each get dealt some cards at the beginning of the game, and you pick a layout, and you want to make all your tiles fit into that layout to get bonus points. Okay. So I love the idea of this game. I love the building the golf course, the taking the tiles. It's a little repetitive because you just keep take tiles, put out five more, take tiles, put out five more, take tiles. But I, I don't mind that. You know, that's it's still fun to build your golf course. And they did all kinds of little, you know, you got the pipes and the jumps and stuff. And you get excited when you build a cool little golf course. Where I have, there's two main problems with the game. One is the artwork is straight up terrible. 
not only is it terrible, but it's a bait and switch because they had a different artist do the cover. Oh. The cover art is not terrible, but hmm. the game artwork is, I'm sorry, maybe it was, it's splatter artwork. Okay. Come on, Eric, say, say I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, well, I haven't looked Eric's at this. Eric's going to say, that's not an insult. That's not necessarily um, bad. Yes, well, it so, is. So they're, they're saying that it's <laughs> it's more functional than it is pretty. Yeah, but you know, they drew all these people, right? But whoever drew them did not do a good job. Oh. And so that's one problem. The other problem is it's so messy with all this scoring and all this stuff. I would have just cut out half of it. You know, maybe you could even add some of these extra scoring methods in as modules like okay you know but i get what they're trying to do but every time you take a tile you have to sit there and go all right i'm gonna do this but i need to check this and that and how does this after a while i was like forget that i'm just building a fun golf course Mm -hmm. you know and then i'll score at the end (sighs) i don't know i just felt it it feels like well it is a kickstarter game and it feels like one it feels like nobody developed it Hmm. it's an interesting idea and if you brought this game to me i'd be like wow you have a really good idea here Let's work on it. So, ah, but you know what? There's a, how many games let you build your own little miniature golf course? Yeah, that's a pretty cool theme. And I'm also a huge sucker. We were just talking about this the other day, how, there's, how few games there are that use the Carcassonne tile laying thing. There's really not that many of them. All right. But it's something I like. I like building these tiles out like a puzzle. And so this does that, and that makes me happy. So... <laughs> I didn't dislike it, but it just could have been much better. Hmm. But if you love miniature golf and you don't really care about art that much, maybe this is for you. That's Mini Golf Designer. Okay. Uh, I also have a Kickstarter game to kick things off today. It's called <laughs> Pulp. <Kick> things off. <laughs> to, it's called Pulp Invasion, uh, designed by Todd Sanders. This is a solo game, although if you get the expansion, it can become a two-player game where you have sort of an adversarial relationship. Uh, this is a resource allocation game. It, uh, I backed it thinking it was sort of a dice rolling game, like maybe a, a sort of a light dice rolling. Um, let's see if I can get through the, the nastiness of, of the solo adventure. Um, the art really drew me in. It is based on, as you might guess from the name, pulp sci-fi my, it covers. really, it looks, is this real pulp artwork or was it done to look like pulp artwork? You know, I, I'm not sure. It looks like it, it is actual pulp artwork. It looks, if it was designed uh, fresh, then it has been done very well. Yes. Um, it could, because it, it looks faded. It looks, it's certainly very much the style of these pulp sci-fi, uh, you know, pieces of art. Um, a lot of the cover or a lot of the cards have cool art on them. The covers are really neat. In fact, I'm I'm don't want to throw away the expansion box because it has such a cool cover. Um, but there's no reason to keep it because everything fits in the in the main box. Anyway, well, cut, cut it off and stick it in the game. Yeah, there you go. I should do that. Um, so you are you have a captain who has some strengths and weaknesses. You've got three stats. You've got like attack value and you've got diplomacy and science, I think is the third one. Um, and you'll get starting stats for that. And your job is to find a certain number of super weapons. Uh, four if you're playing on easy difficulty, four or five, maybe six of them if you want to play on the hardest level. And these are represented by gold cubes which go into a draw bag along with a bunch of other colors as well that represent those stats that we were talking about. Every round of the game, you're going to draw sort of a row of cards, encounter cards, um, four of them. And they represent dangers that you may run into, bad guys you have to fight, uh, locations you may be running into. And you have to encounter them, uh, usually by spending those resources that you started with. You also have these dice. Uh, Your captain comes with a couple of dice that uh, don't get rolled as much. They sort of tick down uh, their special powers that give you bonuses and stuff. And then you use them and they tick down to the next level. And there are ways to recharge them or re-roll them to reset them. Um, so you spend these resources to get through, uh, these, these cards. And if you successfully get through them, then you get some sort of bonus. You, you might get to draw a cube from the bag. You might get a key or a data chip that you can use in a future round to do other various things. This is all affected. The difficulty of these cards are affected by the location you're in and the sector of the galaxy that you're in. So there's a lot of 
Okay, this is a four in blue, except it's actually a five because I'm in this sector and it's this type of card. Plus, there's a special rule for the card. So there is, both physically and mentally, a, a lot of fiddliness to this. Um, a lot of gymnastics that you have to, hoops you have to jump through to figure out what you're doing. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does mean this is a heavier game uh, than I originally thought when, when I backed it. Um, Anyway, once you uh, are drawing cubes from the bag, if you have a certain number of planet symbols on cards that are still active in your card row once you've completed it, you're going to draw cubes from the bag. And this can uh, replenish your stats of the resources that you got rid of. It can also be, if, it, if it's a yellow cube, be one of those super weapons you're looking for. And once you have super weapons in front of you, you can spend super cubes to, to learn them, which allows you to use those special powers in the course of the rest of the game. If you manage to find all four, five, or six gold cubes, you've won the game. If you run out of cards, you fail. And if you run out of two of the three resources, you fail. So if you distill all that down... Ultimately, you're just trying to draw four gold cubes from a bag. You're, you're, all these mechanisms are trying to get you to draw those four cubes, or five cubes, or six cubes. So you could luck out, and on the first couple of rounds, draw all the gold cubes you need. Or you could go the entire length of the game and just not get lucky enough to pull the gold cubes. Um, which might be the ultimate flaw that that knocks this out for me. I still want to explore it. There's still lots of captains to explore. There's lots of planets to explore. Uh, there's even the expansion that adds more planets and, and hegemonic characters to deal with. Um, so I'm excited to explore more, but this, this is probably going to end up as a middle-tier game that I don't play as much as, say, Friday or Finished because it's just a little too complex and it do boils down to the cube draw. Um, hmm. I still, I'm, I'm excited, but I fear that this one's not going to be upper tier solo game for me. That's Pulp Invasion. Upper tier solo game. Well, give, give like an example of an upper tier solo game. Well, like I said, uh, the Freedom and Freeze games, Friday and Finished, are two I really like. Those are those are simple. They're addictive. They move quickly. You get through a round pretty fast. Um, they have a, a motion to them. This this is a little more calculating. It's a little more thinky. See, I wonder if I would like this. This is where I'm at when it comes to solo games. Um, taking out my joke that I'm not a solo gamer, right? Okay, so yep. blah, blah, blah. Ha, ha, But I'm thinking about this, and I tend to like solo games. My favorite kind of solo games are ones where I need to accomplish a goal, and if not, and if even more possible, follow a story. Okay. So if it's, you know, Seventh Continent or Ether mm. Fields or big games like that, I tend to like them because I'm following a story. I'm going through having a good old time. Even a smaller one, if the story is, this one might work, uh, the story is keep your starship alive. I don't know. Sometimes that falls for me a little bit. If, if the mechanisms are really strong, I don't care, like Coffee Roaster. Mm. But Friday fell apart for me because it felt random okay and I also i mean i know it's not blah 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 it's probably not that random but it felt random i'm not saying it is random mm -hmm. and friday also suffered for me because i didn't like the idea of you basically have a wet noodle you're fighting everything with and eventually <laughs> you'll get slightly better yeah so yeah i wonder i i like we've been you know we've been talking for a long time now we're in this thing about solitaire games now yeah I wonder if that's too broad of a category at this point. Like, if I say I like solo games, that doesn't mean I'll like a new solo game. Yeah, no, I mean, you can't really... Solo is not its own category, really, because lots of games can be played. Well, we're kind of we're treating it that way, though, to some degree, right? Yeah, we shouldn't be. <laughs> because there can be there can be very realized, heavy... You I'm can like, play solo war games and... I want fragmentation of us... Do not be unified, solo gamers. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> it's, I don't know. It's interesting. It's just something I've been thinking about lately because there's just, like, if you tell me, Tom, your favorite game comes with a solo variant, I'm probably not interested in it at all. Hmm. But I'm interested in solo games themselves. Okay. I mean, yes. th 
This one looked to be, at least on first glance, a, a lighter dice rolling card uh, tableau game sort of thing. And it is a deeper game than that. It's much more about resource management, and it's it's a little crunchier than I expected it to be. So just be aware if that's one that I'm you're looking you at. I'm saying you sold me on the game. Okay. All right. My next one is De- Decipher, which is actually the name of a board game company. But Yes, it um, is. It, well, does Decipher a, still exist? No, I was about to say, it's the name of a defunct board game yes, company. I didn't think so. So Decipher is a re-implementation of a game called Runes, uh, which came out in 1981. Okay. And they re-implemented this Runes game as Wordsmith last year. By the way, Runes was designed by Bill Eberly, Jack Kittrich, and Peter Olatka, who, if you don't know, are the designers of Cosmic Encounter. Yes. So this is one of the games that uses the sort of word bits, correct? Yeah, there's four word bits. It's a long red stick, a short yellow stick, a green U, and a blue curve that can be used to make S's and things like that. Or maybe the green. No, the blue is a big curve. Sorry, it's a big curve and a little curve. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, in... In the first game, Wordsmith, it was a it was a good game, although I feel like it would not last too long for me time wise because it's just you take these you get these pieces and you build words out of them. So mm-hmm. it's first build letters and then with those letters build words. That's yeah, it's fine. But this one decipher, Eric will make a word for me. It's a four to I think a three to six letter word. So let's say four letters. So he makes the word, I don't know, myth. Okay. M Y T H. So he finds all the pieces to those uh, letters oh, and interesting. puts them in a pile without us looking at it. Everyone else is just sitting there waiting for him to do that. <laughs> then he gives a piece to each player in turn order. So let's say he gives me a long red piece and I say, Is this part of the first letter? I can pick any letter I want. And if it is, so be it. And if it's not, Eric will put a marker on that to show it's not part of that one, but also he gets a point for that. Huh. And we're watching these pieces be put in these things, and slowly we're trying to guess what the word is. In fact, when there's only three pieces left, Eric stops giving us pieces. So I'll look at some spots, and I'll go, well, that's obviously the letter N. Hmm. You know, yes, he could probably add, you know, one more thing to that, but that's got to be N. There's three pieces missing. This spot doesn't even have anything in it. And so you're thinking of all the possibilities, all the all the letters. I find it very interesting now, I will say it's a two- to four-player game, but I think I'm only going to play it with two from now on. Oh, okay. And that's because it gives me a very strong mastermind feel where I'm just sitting there for a really long time thinking. I'm like, I know I can get this. Hmm. You know, this this one here has one red stick and no, and that's it. It's probably a T or it could be an L. You know, you're just trying to figure these things out. The person yeah. giving the, the shapes out, you're trying to give shapes out that don't solve your letters as much as possible right but it's more on the people who are guessing than the person giving the clues okay and of course you're trying to read the other person like would eric give me the word myth you know no vow he would try something like that yeah but then i might i just put the word you know bear because right you know because you were searching for something like myth right I liked it. It's really interesting. It's definitely better than the other game in this in this genre. I tend to like these deduction style games, mm-hmm. and I find it just to be really in, intriguing. And it's fun to see these pieces there as letters and stuff. Um, so then there's a there's a point scoring system in there, yeah, depending on how fast you guess it and so on and so forth. Yeah. But the scoring is almost an afterthought to me. It's the actual gameplay that's an intriguing thing, and that's decipher. Could you play like- it as a one versus many game? It is well. It technically is that way. I mean, Each person but, is one. They give the letter. They give their word, and they'll score points based on how fast it takes someone to guess it. And then whoever guesses it gets points, and everyone else might get a few points. But and then so, the next so, person is the ju- is the person making the word, and you go around like you either everyone. I think everyone is that person twice, and then you. But if you and I were playing against Suzanne, who was coming up with the word, would you and I score the same number of points? No, or are we, we competing for I, points? We are competing. I would try to guess it before you. Right. Okay. But you could <clears> play it in theory as a, you know, as a group guessing game. Yes. Yeah. I suppose. Um, it would be a very different game, I think, because you're trying to outguess the other people. 
Right. And if you could, if you talked, if you talked it out loud, I think you would probably solve them faster. Okay. It's so it's sort of that thinking and keeping stuff to yourself and what do I know that they don't know and Yeah, I think so. Okay. So maybe maybe I would play it with three. I don't think I would play it with four though. Ah, who knows? Either way I enjoyed it. All right. Once again, Decipher is the name of the game we're talking about. Cool. Uh Tom, I don't remember if you have talked about super skill pinball on this program. <sighs> I you know, I wish I remembered if I talked about it. I'm sure I did because I talked about roll and rights and, and and spoiler, this is probably my favorite role and write. Oh, excellent. Uh, I know that Mandy and Suzanne talked about it as one of their top games of the year when we did our, our wrap-up episode. Uh, I had not had a chance to play it yet, but I have corrected that, uh, that circumstance. Super Skill Pinball is from Wids Kids Games, and our friend Jeff Engelstein is the designer here. It is a, a roll-and-write uh, game where you have dry erase boards that represent four different pinball boards. They call them pins, pinball tables. Um, I have played two of the four. Uh, there is a circus-themed one, which is very straightforward. Uh, they, tell that, they tell you that's the one to start with. Um, I've also played the cyberpunk uh, version, which has a bonus game uh, associated that you can trigger. It's sort of a push-your-luck thing. Uh, basically, you have a, a little pinball figure, uh, a piece, that starts at the top of the board. You have three balls. You're trying to score as many points as possible. Um, And so your ball begins. You start at the top of the board. You roll two dice, or someone at the table rolls two dice. Everybody's playing off the same dice. You choose one of the two values, and you will move your pinball to an area that that that's a valid place for that value of the die roll. So you've got bumpers and those need certain values. And you always have to go downstream, uh, down the table, uh, unless there's some rule that says you can bounce around. So there are bumpers that you can, if you get sequential values in the right order, you can continue to bounce around those those bumpers and it's going to earn you points each time. And if you fill up the bumpers, you get to trigger some sort of bonus. There's also um, sort of skill shots. There's uh, targets that you're trying to knock down. If you get all three or all four of those, you can trigger a special ability. And eventually, you're going to work your way down the table to the flippers that also require some sort of value in order to get onto the red flipper or the uh, yellow flipper. And then on your next flippers, you got to get to the keep it up there. No, you got to leave it up there. Leave it up there as long as you can. Well, sure, if you can, Um, because there's only so many. Each time you trigger one of these values, uh, move it to a new location, you're going to cross out that box. And later on, you might not be able to go to the yellow flipper because all the boxes are full. But anyway, the flippers allow you to go back up, uh, and the yellow flipper can hit yellow targets, and the red flipper can hit red targets, and that's how you keep the ball in play. Eventually, you're going to go down, you won't be able to uh, get a value you need, uh, or you're going to head to one of the side, the out lanes, and you're going to lose the ball. Um, but you can also trigger multi-ball and have multiple balls floating around. Uh, and and <sighs> then you continue. Multi-ball is the best. Multi-ball is awesome, although I squandered it. Oh, there's also there's also ways to bump the table. Um, so if a particular value doesn't show up that you really need, you can bump the table uh, and change, say, a three into a four. But whatever the difference is between what the value actually is and what you want it to be, you write that down on the side of the board and then on the next die roll, what it, you look at the difference between the two dice. And so as long as the difference is, let's see, you want it to be less than, no, higher than um, the number that you wrote down. Yes, that's right. Uh, so if I turn to three into a four, I write down one because it's a difference of one. And so the only way I'm going to tilt on the next roll is if doubles show up. But as long as there is at least one difference between the two die rolls, then I'm okay. But if I turned a two into a six, well, now I'm looking at a four, and there's a good chance I'm going to tilt. And if you tilt, you you lose the ball. And you do this for three rounds, and uh, and everybody, not everyone's going to finish at the same time, but you compare points and see who wins. Um, My son destroyed me in our first play of this because I squandered multi-ball. I triggered multi-ball. And then, much like a regular pinball table, I immediately lost one of the balls. I'm like, ooh, multi-ball. Oh, I'm out. And I totally forgot about the tilting mechanism because, much like regular pinball, I don't even consider – I don't like actually trying to shake the table. 
That, I, I feel like that's wrong. I know it's part of the strategy of actually playing with an actual pinball table, but I don't think about it. And so I totally forgot that I could have, like, adjusted a value and maybe saved the ball and kept multi-ball going. Because not only do you have two balls bouncing around, you now have, like, double score. All of your points are doubled while you're in multi-ball. And I totally squandered it, whereas my son triggered multi-ball and he's just bouncing around for the next five minutes. So, anyway, I really enjoy this game. Uh, it it has it is simple. You're just rolling two dice and choosing a value, moving around the board. It all makes sense. Um, but you feel that excitement of oh, I really need a three. I really want to bounce up to this section of the board. I really want to go up that alley. Oh, I, all I need is a six right now. And it has that excitement just from rolling a couple dice and and crossing things off on the board. I really like it. There's there is a uh, a potential for for having a really good round and, and trying to do a catch up, um, and the tables get progressively more interesting. There's a, a medieval like dragon slayer table that has spells and experience points and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and my son is excited to play more tables, so I'm excited to play more super skill pinball. Really like it. Yeah, I enjoy this one. I think it's very fun to play solitaire actually. And I've heard there's a sequel coming with more pinball tables. You are correct. And it's a standalone sequel, so you don't have to have the original box. It's just another four tables, I think. And you can uh, either put well, them together or... right. These four tables, I mean, if you got a copy of the sheet, you just need to know the rules. I mean, any of the... It's obviously standalone in the sense I mean that it's just a die and the sheets. The game has the sheets, really. And... And the markers, yeah, and and I think I believe they haven't taken them down. But WizKids was offering a couple of print and play tables uh, right around the release of this, or right before it was released. And I think you can still do that if you wanted to try the game out uh, without having to get a copy. But it's worth getting a copy. All righty. Well, I'm going to skip my next game because of time. We've talked for quite a bit here. We'll jump <laughs> to Eric's last one, and I'll because my next one is an awesome game. But I'll talk about it next week. Or okay. Two weeks. And I, I won't go long because, Tom, you did talk about this when you played that. I do remember uh, Star Wars Unlock uh, is is one of the more recent sets of the Unlock system. And the first one to be sponsored or, or a, uh, an IP and not just, you know, whatever they decided to, to put together in here. Unlock, as we know, is my favorite of the escape room systems. Um, it is a deck of cards that uses an app and a couple of props on occasion. Um, and I really appreciate how they've been releasing the Unlock adventures lately as trio packs. Uh, so Star Wars Unlock has three games in it, much like a lot of the other recent Unlock adventures. Uh, you have to download a different app. It's not the same app as the other. Uh, I think there's probably some licensing issues there. There probably was. Um, although what's interesting is that even though they have the Star Wars license, they're using the name, they're using characters from the Star Wars universe, um, they did not get the license for Star Wars music. There is no John Williams music in the app. They're still using music from Holst's The Planets, Jupiter and Mars, and I think I think Uranus is in there. One of them. Uh, one of the are, other. Pieces are you kidding? In. You're you're like actually picking the specific pieces. I would have just said holst the planets, and I would have been pretty happy with that. I, I was impressed at least in the first adventure how close some of the sections they chose sounded like John Williams at certain points in the plot. By the second adventure, I was like, oh, Jupiter again, and by the third, I was like, great, okay, holst, got it. Um, the first two adventures are very straightforward. Uh, in fact, this is almost an entry-level unlock adventure. I think it's designed for people who have never done this before. Uh, there's a new version of the demo game, uh, which comes in That's every true. version of unlock. I was tired of playing the original demo, so I'm glad but, they changed but it. But it's the same game. It's the same demo. It's slightly like the, different. It's the puzzles Wars. are exactly the same, Tom. Shh, Eric, come on. <laughs> it's the same demo. It's just Shut got different up. art. Okay, anyway. Um, the first two are very straightforward, fun. I, I enjoyed them, um, but, you know, finished them in about 30 to 40 minutes. They, it was very straightforward. Uh, the, the third one that has a map uh, associated with it, I just barely completed within the time limit. Um, it has that exploration element that I really enjoy from some of the other more recent ones, the Expedition Challenger uh, and the, the, the French one, Lupin uh, Adventure. That, that I really enjoyed as well, where there's there's a sense of travel and exploration and, and 
really, I've really enjoyed those adventures, and this one was no different. Uh, so it's a stellar set all around. Not necessarily my favorite. Um, the, I think that goes with the Timeless Adventures. That's still my number one. But I haven't played the most recent uh, non-themed set. Uh, Epic? Is that the one? I'm not sure. Ah, Star see, Wars. The, the, the problem with them naming these yes. is I can never remember... You know, so let me let me look this up here. Epic Adventures. Oh, Epic Adventures is. Oh, it's kind of a mixed bag. The there's two in there that I thought were good, but the spy one is probably my favorite mm. of all the unlock ones so far. Okay. And I what's mean, the one before that? You said I'm getting. They're all they all roll timeless. Together. I think that's the one with Lupin and the time travel one. Oh, that was such a good one. I really yeah. liked all three of those, actually. That whole box was really, really good. That's, um, if, if you want one where they're all good. But you know what? They're just continually knocking these out. And I like this one better than Eric, Star Wars Unlocked, but that's because I like Star Wars, I think. Sure. I mean, my, my son refused to play it, so it, this was a solo adventure for me. Uh, the second of the three, however, does sort of require you to have a second player. Uh, there's There's one puzzle that they want you to have somebody else, and if you are playing it solo... You're not going to complete the. You, you just basically skip the puzzle. It, it becomes That's, super easy if it's okay. Just, I, I wondered how they would do that because we did get to that puzzle and, and required two people. But I did see something that said if you're playing by yourself, click here. And I oh, almost clicked there because I'm. A was cheater. there something that said if you're playing by yourself, click? Here. I thought there was. I'm pretty sure there was a way to skip it. I may have missed it. I mean, it, yeah, it's 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 just something that the puzzle is more difficult. They want you. To, they give you restrictions, communication restrictions that you're supposed to have two players. Um, but if it's just you, then you're just communicating with yourself, and that's easy. Anyway, it's a great set. Uh, just because it's not my favorite doesn't mean it's a bad box. It is an excellent intro to the Star Wars universe, and I would certainly give this as a gift to somebody uh, to say, "Hey, here's something cool. Um, check these out." And of course, there's tons of advertisements inside the box that says, "If you like this." There's a bunch of these. Um, so big thumbs up for Star Wars Unlocked. All righty. Well, let's jump to Jeff. And he, Jeff's going to talk about one of my favorite topics in the world, which is food. Also, sugar cookies. And hmm. anyway, it's a bait and switch. But stay tuned. <laughs> It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. There's been a lot of conflict and strife recently, so let's take a collective step back and talk about something hopefully uncontroversial. Cookies. The baked kind, not the computer kind. Now, we're a few weeks past the holiday season, and a common tradition is baking and trading cookies with others. Even with COVID, I know many people that left socially distanced cookie care packages for friends and neighbors. Now, perhaps the most common type of holiday cookie, particularly if you're baking with kids, is the humble sugar cookie. You roll out the dough and use cookie cutters to punch out fun shapes. Now, if you're anything like me, and hope for your sake you're not, you like to play a little game when using cookie cutters. How many cookies can you get out of a sheet of dough? How can you arrange the cookie cutter shapes in such a way as to have as little wasted dough as possible? Yes, I know you can take your leftover your dough, squish it together, and roll it again for more cookies, but let's ignore that for now. How easy is it to determine the best way to arrange your cookie cutters for maximum efficiency? Well, mathematicians have studied this problem, and it turns out it's hard. Like, really, really hard. Even with simple shapes. For example, let's look at squares. Let's say I have a cookie cutter that makes a one-inch square cookie. And let's say I'm trying to get a specific number of cookies. What is the smallest square piece of dough that will allow me to get that number of cookies? Well, if you want four cookies, the answer is simple. You just take a square that is two inches per side and you can get perfectly fitting four squares. If you go to five, the solution is to take your fifth square and rotate it 45 degrees so it looks like a diamond. Then put the other four squares in the corner just touching the central diamond. Now, so far, so good, but the problem gets super hard, super fast. For example, the best known arrangement for 11 squares in a bigger square looks wild. The squares are all at weird angles and there are tiny gaps between some of them so that the corners of other squares can poke in between them. 
and it is not known if this is the best arrangement. The picture of the 11 square arrangement is something to see, and I will post it in the Dice Tower Guild so you can check it out. So, can computers help us? Well, it turns out that they can't. There can't be an algorithm that will figure out the best way to arrange the squares. The problem is that the squares can be moved and rotated by infinitesimal amounts. So there is an infinitely large space to search, and it's all the real numbers, not just all the integers, so it's big infinity, Aleph 1 versus Aleph null, if you know those terms. Now, many years ago in game tech, I talked about very complex problems like the traveling salesman problem, which is a pick up del and deliver game on steroids. Now in this problem, you have a map with a number of cities and you need to figure out the shortest path that visits each city one time. It turns out that there is basically no better way to solve the problem than just trying all the different combinations. This type of complexity is called NP complete. NP complete problems are a very well studied type of problem by computer scientists and mathematicians as they have a lot of practical applications like factoring primes and breaking codes and yes, scheduling delivery routes. But they can be solved by a computer. It may take a while to crunch through the numbers, but you'll get there. Now our problem with square cookies is in a whole different complexity class. It is called ETR complexity, which stands for Existential Theory of the Reals. I love that so much, I'm going to say it again. Existential Theory of the Reals, ETR. Now here's another ETR problem, which might also make a good game or puzzle called the art gallery problem. Now in this problem, you are given a polygon that can be shaped any which way. There can be different rooms, tiny nooks or alcoves, protuberances, hallways, whatever. The only rule is that the space needs to be connected into a single area and that the sides can't cross over each other. Now that you've got a space, you need to put guards in there to protect it. Each guard protects everything it can see from its spot and it can look all the way around 360 degrees. But because of the shape, there may be nooks and crannies in or other rooms that it just can't see. The problem is, what is the fewest number of guards that you can put in your gallery such that they see every single point. This problem is also ETR complexity. You can see the similarity to the cookie problem. You can shift a guard a very, very small amount and that may have a big impact on what they can see. Because of the way you can shift things so minutely, there's no step-by-step -step way to solve the cookie or the art gallery problem. Mathematicians are now conjecturing that these types of problems can never be definitively solved by computers no matter how powerful they get. Take that AI. So the next time you're using cookie cutters, think about how you're arranging them and how you're just as good as doing it as a computer. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. And that's why I'm smarter than a computer. I told you, Eric. Yes, indeed. Uh, I think that Jeff's uh, discussion about the, the museum problem would make an interesting game. You like add rooms to your museum, but you have to maintain guarding. So as you grow, you have to hire more security guards so that they can see everything or move them around so that you can still cover all the stuff you've got. I think there's a game in there. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for cookies. <laughs> and now, another tale of board gaming horror. Horrific. Gather round, children. In 2019, our board game league was having its annual Christmas and awards game night, and a friend of mine had excitedly let us know he was bringing a new game he had gotten for Christmas and opened up but hadn't yet played. The game was Sushi Go Party in a tin box full of 181 cards. It had snowed earlier that day, but was unseasonably warm, so the snow was quickly starting to melt shortly after falling, resulting in an environment of wet, slushy, sticky, sloppy snow and puddles. I was inside along with several others setting up tables and visiting, when he suddenly came in the door with quite the look of horror on his face, and we quickly realized what had happened. 
in the slush. He had lost his footing. And in his attempt to correct his balance, his brand new, unplayed copy of Sushi Go Party took to the skies, and the cards burst from the tin like a confetti cannon into the snow and puddles. Several hurried out to help collect the cards and bring them inside to a table to dry, but the amount of moisture on the vast majority of the cards was an insurmountable foe. Needless to say, that particular copy of Sushi Go Party was never played. <laughs> you know, I'm so glad we don't have slush. I've never missed slush. Ever down here in Florida. Well, thank you for rubbing it in. I, I Don't I try to do that to you on a regular basis? Yes, indeed. If I don't you mean do. to, I, I need to... Like, this morning, I should have sent you a, a text that said, Eric, I had to put a jacket on because it was 60 degrees when I went for oh my, my morning walk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my new driveway is on an angle. And so if I don't clear my driveway, I, I can't get the car out of the house because it gets too slippery. So that, that makes me angry. Yes, folks, if you have a terrible tale of horror, uh, send it to us at... Uh, horror at dicetower.com. Or you Ooh, just send it we to have it. a horror address? I can make anything I want, Eric. <laughs> just send it to Tom at dicetower.com. That's a okay. synonym for horror anyway. That's what my <laughs> daughter that's what my daughter said. Well actually she said dad, but whatever. Yep. Alrighty. Well that's that. Let's move the questions. 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 Trenton says, Hi Tom, you and Eric went through the twenty sixteen games and how great a year it was, which had me wondering in a given year, do you know if it's been an amazing year during the year? Or if not, how long does it take you to know? March of the next year. I actually know. Like, I always think every year's amazing, right? <laughs> oh, what a great year this was. Well, yeah. You know, I, to the point of silliness. But I think it's the five-year mark where you can really look back at a year. Yeah, I mean, at least knowing for sure. It's when you, you look back at the whole thing at once. Um, which, I mean, we do in December when we try and put together our best of list, but there's so many gaps that it's hard to really get a sense of everything until some of those uh, have had a, sen- a chance to settle and see which games have stuck around. And, and that's often what makes us say good or bad as far as years go. I think you're right. I think that five-year mark does, does reach a significant milestone in figuring it out. Don't get me wrong. I mean, every year there's no slouch. 2015 is a great year, too. But I also think a lot of games kind of settle into their powerful positions that they are. It takes that a while to go. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I guess the four-year mark now is 2017. So 2017 was 100% the year of Gloomhaven. Does that mean it's the best year ever? I don't know. I I might argue that it's not, but it definitely was the year of Gloomhaven. Hmm. I don't know. There's a lot of great games, folks. You could pick one year from the 2010s, play only games for that year for the rest of your life, and you'd be okay. There are a lot of games, yes. Linder says it seems to be standard for age ranges to be put on the outside of the box of a game. Well, Board Game Geek uses their five point complexity ratings. Do you think that these measure the exact same thing, or is there some fundamental difference? If so, what are examples of complex games you would play with young kids or simple games you would only play with adults? I think um, they're both not that useful for (laughs) different reasons, actually. (laughs) Okay. Okay, the, the age range put on the outside of the box is a sales pitch mixed with a we didn't want to pay for a ton of testing. Right. It's it's a marketing and sales thing. Because there's so many, you know, if you want to go all the way down to three plus, then you have to have more testing done. That's not cheap testing. Mm -hmm. So it's just easier sometimes to put 10 plus, 13 plus. Then there's that whole thing. If you put 13 plus in the box, uh, some kids will be like, I'm pretty smart. I can play this game. Yeah. Uh, It's (laughs) very rarely do I go by the ages, unless it's a company that specifically caters to ages like, let's say, Haba or something, you know. But for the most part, I don't even look at the ages anymore. 
The only time I might notice is if they say like 17 plus, I'll be like, why? Yeah. They say that. But other than that, whatever. Uh, For the, on the other hand, the complexity ratings on BGG, I think are absolute silliness. Now, I shouldn't say absolute silliness, but I think, I think they, they're, the average board game geek user tends to like more complex games. So there's a lot of games in there that are ranked fairly, I, all the, all the weight skews lower than it really is. Right. You, you've talked about this before in like, what is the hypothetical five? No, there, it's like there's literally no hype. There's like no five. I mean, there's literally no five. So let's say I pick uh, what's a really complex game. Um, uh, so Vital this? Lacerda, Lisboa. All right. So Lisboa. So I go to Lisboa, okay, which is ranked 70, and I look for the weight. So it has a 4.57 out of 5. That's pretty high. Or, oh, yeah, it is. Six people said it was a 1. What? <laughs> <laughs> Four people said it was a two. They were, you know, was Wait, what? 25, 25 said it was a three. And 192 said it was a four, Eric. Okay. If it's a four, what are those 192 people rating a five? And I think I would posit there's a lot of mythical people out there who won't rate something a five because they're like, well, this isn't that hard for me. I haven't found it yet. I'm still searching for my five. Yeah, I mean, well, is, or I mean, is it the games, you know, the ones that the the big war games that take 2 days to play? All right. Well, here's Campaign for North Africa. Has 90 ratings. This is the one that takes uh 60,000 minutes to play. Okay. All right. 90 people rated it a 5, but 6 people rated it a 1. Wait, what who that's, is rating? That's That's just people being stupid. <laughs> but because fewer people rate on these scales, I don't know. And who is do, I, who is doing spoiler votes on the complexity scale? On the complexity, right? You know. I, I mean, I understand the people <laughs> are like, I don't want such, you know, X game to to be the number one game on Board Game Geek, so I'm going to counteract any of those tens with a one from me. But are you? But that's doing not that? my problem with the game with with the whole system, Eric. It's just that the system itself doesn't work. For example, we'll take Ticket to Ride. We'd all argue that Ticket to Ride, a great welcoming game, a game to teach people to play with, but it is by no means a nothing game. But yeah. I, I go here to Boyd Bjorn Geek. 32 people have rated it a five. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> okay. But 1,440 people voted a one, it's, which is the very lightest on the scale. That's it's Candyland. One is Candyland. Right? Okay, I'm actually looking up Candyland now. <laughs> <laughs> if there are any think? fives in there. <laughs> I hope there is. Please, 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 please. Where is Candyland? Is Candyland two words? Uh, I think it's one. Uh, maybe not. not. Maybe it is too. Seeing in here, I'm seeing a lot of Candyland. There's Candyland Bingo, which I've actually played. Um, you're right. It is too. Okay, so the average weight of this is 1.08. Okay. Yes, four four people rated it a five, <laughs> but 308 people rated it a one. So 97.2 percent. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> Candyland and Ticket to Ride are both not ones. But there are people out there who would argue to death of me. They're like, no, it's a really, 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 really light game. And I'm like, no, to you, it's a really, really yeah. light game. It's all it's all subjective. Well, that's why it's all average. I just don't think they're worth it. The, the weightings, you look at it and you'll say, well, ah, yeah, this looks light, but it may not be to you. Yeah. So I, I mean, going back to Linder's question, let's let's set aside the fact that this whole concept is illegitimate. But if there was some validity to these numbers... There could be reasons why uh, a game would be would have a, a higher um, age range, uh, but still be super well, light. Well, that's content. I mean, it's like, content. It could also be ability if it's a dexterity game. Cards Against game. Humanity is a super light game, but you probably shouldn't play it with kids. Well, yes, yeah. There's that, uh, and and you know certain you dexterity games either, that you would play with adults um, because of of you know motor ability, motor skills, uh, that, that young kids would not be able to do yet. Um, so, so there's, there is, there's a lot of overlap here in the complexity versus age range, but there are other reasons to, to, um, stray from that. 
All right, Elaine says, I've heard a lot of talk about linen finished cards, and are they Ooh. higher quality than regular cards? Yes. Do they really need card sleeves to protect them from wear and tear, finger oils, food stains, beverage spills, and so on? Yes. I suppose regular cards would, but I'm not sure. Cards with linen finish justify the extra expense. I figured I'd go to the experts for the best advice, so I'll be talking to someone else. <laughs> he doesn't say that. Um, <laughs> Just wanted to let you know. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so card quality, there's a lot of, of things that come in to deal with card quality. Thickness is one. You can have really thin cards. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I played a game recently that had linen finish on the cards, and I was convinced that if you took the linen finish away, the card would disappear. There wouldn't be anything left. It was that thin. But the thickness matters. But you can also have cards that then don't feel right because they're too thick. Mm. So then there's the material. I'm a anti-plastic. People, Some people like plastic, but they always fall over to four for me. Yeah. But a... The cardboard, the certain stocks that they use, some just work better than others. But linen finish, not only does it seem like it holds wear and tear pretty well, it feels that way, it, so far in my experience, but they feel great. They're easier to pick up. They feel good in your hand. You can tell linen finish every single time. I don't even have to ask. I just pick it up and I know it's linen finish. Right. I think it's also the the adherence to other cards in the deck. They they slide over each other, I think, better than than a non-linen finish card can. They Those can get yeah. sticky and, and stick to each other and make it hard to shuffle. So if you think about some games like Magic the Gathering does not use actually high quality card stock for their game, mm. but everybody sleeves in that game. You don't need to sleeve your games. It all depends on you. I'm not going to say people who sleeve are wrong or people who don't sleeve are wrong, although you'll meet people on both ends. But I will say on a personal preference, I hate shuffling a sleeve deck of cards. Mm. Um. It just, and every time I say this, someone's going to email me and tell me a good way to do it. No. Right. Okay. It just doesn't work for me. I like riffle shuffling a deck of cards. I don't mind the wear and tear. And I definitely don't look at the edges and corners of them trying to figure out what the card is. But Tom, on. if somebody had taken the time to sleeve that copy of Sushi Go Party, we would not have this tale of horror. Yeah, you would. If it fell in the slush, sleeves aren't going to help. I guess it would. The, the sleeve would soak up the. <laughs> The unless, <laughs> unless you are double sleeving, yes, which I'm still amazed. I did not know this existed, folks, until like a year ago. So you can buy inner sleeves, small sleeves. You put them on a card, then you turn that sleeve upside down and insert it in another sleeve. So it's basically a, a seal because there's always an open end if you're just doing a single sleeve. <laughs> I was explaining to my kids they were. We were sleeving. We got the. I'm very excited about this, Eric. We got these sleeves from the Dice Tower 2020 Kickstarter. Yeah, and they're the Dixit card size, and so I've taken multiple copies of Dixit and its expansions. And um, what else did I take? I think Mysterium. Mysterium, yeah. And um, what's the game from Quick Simple Fun? Uh, Muse. Muse, yep. And Detective Club. And I've mixed these all together. Oh. And because I have them sleeved, you can't tell. So I have this mega deck, and you can play any of these games with it. I'm pretty excited about that. That is kind of cool. Yeah, so I really like that. They did many, many people did not want these decks of cards, unfortunately. But I like them a lot. So in the Dice Tower Library, you'll be able to check out this mega deck of cards if you just want to play one of these games with it. I mean, if you really want to make your cards waterproof, you could just take it down to the uh, the teacher's supply store and run it through the laminator. No, just the and whole there's deck. a problem with that. That only works if you you run into a few problems with that. One, when they come out, you need to cut them perfectly, or you will be able to tell. That's true. Secondly, I run a lot of stuff through the laminator. We laminate stuff here at Dice Tower all the time, and there's a chance. Sometimes it messes up. It doesn't mm. happen all the time, but sometimes it does. And that doesn't make you happy when it's one of your cards to your game. That is true. And then you'll have to, you also have to round all the corners, mm. which is horrific. So it's just not worth it. Just get linen finish is what it we're saying. Don't, don't. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, Richie says, in December, I received Etherfields and Adventure Tactics a few weeks apart. Yes, I'm a Kickstarter. Uh, I'm, I'm all over Kickstarter, I know. I'm getting help. Getting them so soon after each other, it was easy to notice the games had a similar mechanism. Both games like to build up your deck. While Etherfields calls itself a deck builder, I felt like this was a bit of a misnomer. Certainly, you build your deck in both of them, but not necessarily in the same spirit as the prototypical deck builder Dominion. Is there a better or official word for this? I have been using the term deck advancement for both Etherfields and Adventure Tactics, as you advance and improve your deck as you play, but is there more official board game geek category? The key distinguishing factor seems to be when you upgrade your deck. If you upgrade during a single play, that puts it into the deck building category. If you upgrade after a single play, that puts it in the deck advancement category. Of course, a game could have both. What do you and Eric think? <sighs> well, first of all, I like how he said he uses the term deck advancement and then later on used it as if that's the actual term everyone else uses. <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, I kind of like it. I, you're talking about. Um, I haven't played either of these, but I've played uh, the Pathfinder Adventure card game, which... Yeah, same as that. Same um, thing. So you're acquiring... I guess you are adding cards during the game, but the real deck building part is in between adventures when you decide what cards you're keeping. Um, and Right. And yeah, deck advancement sort of works um, to separate it from the in-game deck building. I like it. Yeah, I don't know what the terminology is, but I agree. We've been talking about this lately because I want to say deck builder, but it's not quite. But it gives me the same feeling as a deck builder. Like, ooh, I'm adding this card to my deck and now it's going to show up. So it's like a much slower deck builder. It's basically a campaign deck builder. Yeah, it's the, the scale is different. It, it's not but a single adventure. There's all kinds of things. I think we're going to look back at 2020 and notice a, t a, a deck builder. You know, Dominion came out in 2008. So it's been 12 years. Yeah. Deck buildings, when it first came out, a lot of copycats doing pretty much the same thing. Then they started mutating a bit. Mm -hmm. But wow, there was a ton of games this year that came that used deck building just as a minor mechanism in the game or even a major one, but did it in different ways. Not just these, but we saw it in Dune Imperium. Um, we saw it in Lost Temples of Arnak. And, many, and and those are the two of the more well-known ones. But there were several games over the course of the year. Um, the uh, the new West Kingdom one, the uh, Viscounts of the West Kingdom, has a little bit of that in it. And so they just all do it in different ways, and I find it to be fascinating. Hmm. So, yeah, we'll probably have in-depth terms at some point, but I don't know when. Hmm. Well, then we should ask Jeff. He He's written the book on it, so... <laughs> Kevin says he was thinking about how he rates games, and he wonders what we think about this. So this is what he's talking about. He says, if I was giving a rating to the game, we're doomed. A terrible party game from breaking... He didn't say it terrible. <laughs> I, that's editorial for me. A party game from breaking games. He said, based on his comparison to other party games, he would give it a 9 out of 10. He loves this game out of party games. Okay. And if he doesn't look at categories at all, he gives Mariposas a 7 out of 10. But... Even though he gives Word Doom to rating out of 10, if only comparing it to party games, he would always pick Mariposas over Word Doomed. And that's because if he said if he rates Doomed, Word Doomed with all games in mind, it would be a 5.5 or a 6. He enjoys the game, it's just not his preferred bucket of games to feel that score doesn't reflect its worth. So, what I'm asking is should we keep all games in mind when rating a game? Or do you think rating them based on a comparison with the rest of their bucket makes more sense? And then he said some very nice things about us. Thank you. Uh, I mean, oh, I got I got an opinion. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you do. I so when I'm rating games, I don't I don't separate them into buckets. That's what the top 10 lists are for when you can rank things against each other in certain categories, because then what criteria are you using? Um, I, I, I'm ranking them against how much I want to play this game. And that factors in what genre it is, what type of game it is. I'm not doing mini rankings based on its category or genre or theme or whatever when I'm giving a number to a game. Uh, how much do I want to play this? That's the number. So, no, I'm not, I'm not separating into buckets when I give something a number. That's what ranking in a list is for. 
Right. And, and, and the thing is, I, I agree a hundred percent. If you say it's a nine compared to other party games, but then when you rank it to everything else, it's a 5.5. It's not really a nine then not even close. Mm. I mean, it almost makes it sound like you don't like party games. And if you actually think we're doomed as a nine compared to other party games. Whew. But this is, you know, talking about the, the complaining of how everybody That's has different you criteria like for, uh, you know, how they rank things. Everyone is doing different math in their head when they're giving rankings to things. So, yes, averaging sort of evens all of this out. But taking any individual ranking from one person, oh, so-and-so gave this a nine. In what regard? You know, everyone has a different ranking in their head of how they're putting things uh, or associating a number with them. Yes, but also I think some of this just has to do with the fact that some people just there, there seems to be a bias against certain games. Every year when I do my top 100, there's always a party game or two or three or more in it. Mm-hmm. And people are like, how could you possibly put a party game and say a party game's better than this? Because it is for me. Yeah, ratings are just subjective. But, you know, when I come out of a game of Time's Up, I might want to play that more than Mariposa's. You know, it just might be the way it is. Right. Now, there's a time and a place for everything. So ratings to me aren't 100% in the sense of if I'm at a party... I'm probably not going to bring out, you know, Descent, even though I like it a lot. That's not the place. I'm not even in the mood to play it. And I might play a lower ranked game more often than a higher ranked game, but that's because of ease to get to the table, fatigue of learning, you know, remembering all these rules and stuff. But at the end of the time, I compare a game to every other game in existence. It's not always easy, and sometimes it doesn't make sense. Can you compare Pitch Car to Apples to Apples? to Lisboa, to an 18xx game. That's kind of a weird combination of games to mix together. Yeah. Alrighty, folks, that is our questions. And I would like to remind you, some of those questions sounded recent because they are recent. I'm almost out. Ooh. We got very few questions over the Christmas break. Send them questions. Make them hard. Send in difficult questions. Um, I did get someone trying to get me to troll you for... Merchants of Venus, but I, I said I would not make fun of Eric about Merchants of Venus on air. Ah, wait, no, sir. But you did no, sir. earlier, right? That's what I said. I don't remember what you're talking about. Uh, let's continue. Uh, let's get to looking at games in a particular bucket. It's a Dice Tower Top Ten! The Dice Tower's Top Ten list is brought to you by The Op, also known as USAopoly, at The Op. Games. And we're back to the alphabet. Now, interesting enough, when we were going through these and I didn't think much about it, I said, oh, it's time for W. Ooh, here we go. And then I was like, oh, no, so many great W games I'm cutting out hmm. of my top 10 <laughs> because W is a solid letter, folks. There's the, I was a little worried solid. just thinking at first about it, but there are some strong games in here. We have a decent amount of crossover. No, not a decent amount of crossover. We have a decent amount of different games. But one, two, three of Eric's games I highly considered to put on my list. All right. That didn't make it. So I'm counting them as my 11, 12, and 13. (laughs) Okay. I I look forward to hearing where they fall. I'm just going to, as soon as you say it, I'll just shout out, take over the thing. Sure. Because this is all about my list, Eric. Mine as well. Eric will be like, my number 10. Well, that was my number 47. And actually, let me talk about it for a while. <laughs> I mean, that makes my job easy. Number 10. Let's kick things off with Wildlands. This is... Actually, that was my... Sorry, go ahead. This is Martin Wallace's Minis Skirmish game. Uh, it You you have a, a little squad of characters, and it's almost a little bit of a hide-and-seek. They don't all start out on the board, uh, and you are trying to take out the other players and, and hit certain locations on the board uh, to score points, and it's a race to score those points. It's card-based. Uh, you're moving around and attacking the other players, trying to find where they are, and score your own points. Uh, lots of different characters and squads and, uh, and lots of maps and expansions for this game wildlands number 10 all joking aside wildlands is my number 11 okay. i really struggle i really like this game it's a good one and there's a new expansion standalone thing that um i got sitting on my desk and i can't wait to play mm. it. 
My number 10 is a party game. I said I like party games, and this is one of a few party games that makes my list. When I Dream is a unique party game in which everyone is working together, sort of, to get someone to guess a word. So let's say Eric's the guesser. He'll put some... He'll cover up his eyes with one of those sleeping bands, whatever they're called. Yep, but, but, and yeah. then blindfold. each person, yeah, blindfold. Each person is going to give him a clue, one word clues, trying to get him to guess words. But some of us don't want him to get those words correct. And some people want him to get some, but not all of them correct. So we might be giving him false words, but Eric, after a while, he'll be like, you know, Tom's words make no sense. I'm just going to not listen to him ever when it's his turn. So I don't want to be too erroneous because then Eric will will know, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's a really fascinating game. I like it a lot when I dream. It it, it made it breaks my brain. It's it's a tricky one too. It's it's not a straightforward party game. It's one that you have to really sort of think about. Number nine. Number nine is Wordsy. This is Gil Hova's word game. Uh, it, it is a spelling game that doesn't necessarily require that you have all the words or the letters in your hand to spell the words that you want. You're trying to score as many points as you can using the words or the letters that are in front of you. Uh, and, and you are rewarded for using the letters that are out on the table, but you don't need them. And so it makes it a little easier to build the words in Wordsy. Number nine. My number nine is one of the biggest games on this list. Actually, it probably is the biggest game, and that's War of the Ring. We'll say second edition, but, you know, it's any of them. Like, you know, they're very close. War of the Ring is the entire Lord of the Rings on a board game where one player is controlling the Fellowship of the Ring, trying to get Frodo to throw the ring in a mountain, while also using armies and politics all over the map to fight against the Shadow Player. There is a ton going on in this game. I like it a lot. It has been a while since I played it, which is why it's not higher. It's a pretty lengthy two-player game. I know, I know you can play it with four, but it's a two-player game. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. I've been watching the Lord of the Rings series lately for whatever reason. I just felt like watching it again. So I'm kind of anxious to try it out. That's War of the Ring, my number nine. All right. Number eight. I do think it's interesting that on a list where we have so many disparate selections, not a whole lot of crossover, when we get to number eight, we synced up exactly with... Well, we'll never know. I always say that. You say this and then... It it was not... I, I didn't even notice. I just typed them all in a row and then I looked up and went, oh, Tom also put Wallenstein uh, as number eight. Uh, this is a... a, a Area control game. Uh, you've got a map of Germany, and you are are programming your actions for the different sections on the board. So you might uh, tax an area that you control to earn more money, but you may also be moving your troops around and trying to invade other areas and building castles and all sorts of stuff. But this is all programmed in before you um, you actually activate all of those actions. And the combat in this game is using a cube tower, which is a really cool mechanism. You throw your cubes in there and see what comes out, and that's who survives. But then those troops stay in the tower, and they could come out in the future, which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah I yeah. said pretty much everything I said. Uh, this one is still... Have you... When did you play this? Oh, boy. Um, Has it been a while? Because this... I don't remember hearing you talk about much before. Maybe I'm just a very forgetful person. No, I, I mean, it's certainly, this is one that I played early on in my gaming career, and I think before I was here on the show with you. So it's only made occasional uh, appearances on any of my lists. Um, but it is one that I enjoyed in my earlier days of gaming. Um, and online, too. There was an online implementation on one of the one of the sites that I can't think of now. But yeah, my game group really likes it. It is a good game. I like it a lot. This is another one that's been a while since I played it. And I feel like when I'm, I've, I backed the recent campaign that get upgrade pieces for it. Mm. And I feel like when they come in, it might be time to pull it out again. Yeah, Wallenstein. Well, it probably would. Number seven. My number seven is a cooperative uh, game called Walkstar. It's a real-time game. You're running a, a Chinese restaurant and trying to fulfill orders for people, but in order to do so, you need ingredients. So you have to create uh, those ingredients using die rolls and combo comboing dice and borrowing dice from other players and making sure you have the ingredients you need to fulfill orders that people want and doing so uh, before you run out of time and trying to make enough money to save the restaurant. Walkstar, number seven. My number seven is Rec Raiders. It starts with a W, I promise. Yep. Um, <laughs> Rec Raiders from uh, KBTG 
is probably my favorite game from that line. I just love this game. Beautiful components. You're throwing dice into a box, using those dice to get various tiles. It's a big underwater fishing thing, building your own tank and an aquarium with stuff in it. It's really cool. It's built as a uh, kids kids uh, board table kids table board games. They pride themselves on making family style games, games that are appeal to the whole family. And Rec Raiders is like the ultimate of that. But I could also play it with just gamers too. Solid game, love it. Rec Raiders number six. My number six is another word game uh, that is a tug of war. Uh, it's called Word on the Street. Uh, you have a, a line of word tiles, letter tiles, and uh, you'll be given a category and you will take turns. Uh, it's a sort of an adversarial game, two players or two teams uh, that are naming words in a category. And every time you name a word, you spell it out. And every time you use a letter, you get to move that letter tile closer to you. And you are trying to capture those letter tiles uh, in order to to win the game and see who gets more. Is it? It's either a who gets more of them or it's a, I think, once you've captured a certain number, that ends the round. Um, it, what I like about it is that it is great for uh, kids who are learning to spell and, and w- w- expanding their vocabulary. Uh, it's a cool adversarial tug of war uh, in a word game form. Word on the street, number six. Yeah, this was another one I considered strongly. It's such a great game. My number six is a two-player game. It just came out last or two years ago, actually. It's not, I keep forgetting it's 2021. Um, and that is Watergate. Great two-player game where you're playing based on the reporters versus Richard Nixon era of Watergate. But if you're not a huge fan of politics, you can still kind of ignore that. It's a bit abstract at the game, but it is a mini Twilight struggle, if that makes sense. A nice little back and forth game. If you like tug of war style games, two player ones, this one's fantastic. Watergate, my number six. Hmm. Number five. My number five, if it weren't available only in German, wouldn't be on this list because it is Würfel Bonanza, Würfel being dice. Uh, This is the Bonanza dice game. It is a shame that this game has not been available in English. I don't know why Rio Grande has not brought it over. But anyway, it is a a dice rolling uh, game where you're you're trying to complete uh, combinations of beans, the beans from Bonanza. Uh, But the other players are also watching you roll those dice and possibly scoring combinations while you are taking your turn and trying to earn more money by the time the... uh, the game is over. It's actually a race to, I think, 15 coins to see who gets there first. Vorful Bonanza, number five. My number five is Straight Up Werewolf. Mm-hmm. I love Werewolf. Fantastic game. We play it all the time. It's my most played game, game-wise, I think, of 2020 because we've been playing it on Zoom. It turns out works really well on Zoom. Yeah. Eric said he would join me. Still hasn't. Um, I just want to have everyone have their eyes closed and suddenly Eric's like, everybody, everyone close your eyes, but they're already closed. So it's kind of confusing, but it's true. Um, anyhow, fantastic game. I understand that there are better, smoother social deduction games without player elimination, but there's something about werewolf that I still love in its purest form. It's fantastic. So werewolf. Oh, also, we have a custom cool deck of werewolf cards you can get on the Kick- Dice Tower Kickstarter. So Is that why you put it on out. the list? No. Wow. I, it starts with a W, wow. Eric. Yeah. Okay. Number four. Number four is a game about horse racing from Reiner Knizia. It's called Winner's Circle. Uh, you've got a bunch of horses, and they have different stats. The, some will sort of go slow and steady, and others have um, varying uh, speeds that they'll go based on the results of the die rolls. So they're a little more risky. And then you do secret bits, uh, beds, beds, bits, no, bets, secretly bet on them, on uh, on the horses. And uh, and some of them are fake bets, some of them are double bets, and then you see who can win the race and earn money for the bets that you have performed. Uh, it's a it's a lovely game, one I haven't played in a while, um, and one that hasn't been out in English for a while. There have been other editions in like in China, I think, and we've seen them at Essen, but I, there hasn't been a North American version of this in a while. Winner's Circle, number four. Yeah, it feels like it's about time for one to come out. That's for sure. 
My number four is War Chest. It is a great abstract strategy game. It has a little bit of a war theme to it. You have these different pieces, you know, knights and things, but each side has them. It's a tiny bit of a deck building, not deck building, eh, kind of deck building game, I suppose, where you have these cards. When they come up, you decide whether you use them to deploy the troops, move the troops, and you're just trying to capture different spots on the board. And since you pick different armies each game, every game's going to be slightly different. Really solid game with cool poker chips. War Chest. I, I've always wanted to try this one. I've never had a chance to play it. Number three. Wavelength is my number three, one of my favorite party games of the last few years. And in fact, I played this last night with Crystal Dax on Dice Tower Tonight. We played with the live chat uh, and, and had the chat giving the two of us clues to try and come up with the puzzles. Uh, but at its core, it's a team-based game uh, where you're trying to name, you, you name a word that falls somewhere on a spectrum, and then your team is trying to guess where on that spectrum that that word falls. Um, it, it offers some neat discussion, um, but it's still simple enough that it's not uh, overwhelming as a party game. Now, uh, you can still get into it very easily, but it offers some some interesting analysis of the people you're playing with and some after round discussion. Why in the world did you put books in the, you know, five o'clock position when obviously it should be in the 11 o'clock position? Anyway, wavelength number three. Yeah, I really like this one also. My number three is Western Legends, the ultimate cowboy game. It's a sandbox game. There's not many of those that exist. That means you can do what you want. You can go wrestle cattle or you can go deliver cattle legally. You can go rob the bank or go arrest the guy who just robbed the bank. You can go play some cards or go just shoot up someone for no reason. Go out and hunt bandits or all kinds of things. And when you add the expansion in, you can also rob the train. All kinds of fun things. Do what you want. It's really fun. Western Legends, my number three. Number two. I think my number two is my most played of, of my list here, and that's Wits and Wagers, uh, partially because we played this a lot, Tom, you and I, uh, running games for various conventions. We haven't done so in the last year or so. Um, but it's a, it's a lovely party game where you are betting on the answers to trivia questions um, and uh, earning money for answering correctly, but also for betting on the players or the answers that guess correctly or close to it. Um, it's, a, it's a great format for a party game and a trivia game. It works so well for varying groups of people from just a couple, just a handful, to large roomfuls of teams. Wits and Wagers, number two. This one makes me sad, though. I love running those Wits and Wagers giant games. Yeah. I haven't done that in such a long time. Yeah, I think the, the cruise, the, the, the party before the cruise was the last time we played an edition of Wits and Wagers. No, no, we ran one at Dice Tower West. We did do one at Dice Tower West. Yes. So, yeah, is what it is. All right, my number two is higher in X list. What? So we'll, we will fly to that moment right now. Let's fly. And finally, number one. Number one is Wingspan. Uh, Elizabeth Hargrave's game about birds. You're creating a tableau of these birds, triggering their actions in a sort of a sequential order, uh, earning eggs to trigger abilities and scoring points. Um, it is a, a lovely theme for a game, lovely art in the game, wonderful production for the game. Um, really uh, hits on all cylinders. Wingspan, my number one. And Tom's number two. Yeah. Yeah, Wingspan. What I mean, we talk about it a lot, but it's a solid game. I still really enjoy it. I saw someone said uh, recently on one of my our YouTube videos, someone said Wingspan is when Stonemaier Games jumped the shark, and I was like, how? How did what? Jumped the shark. That's like, that's like when they're it's like their biggest game. That's not jumping the shark, but anyhow, the shark jumping the shark to glory, maybe. My number one is Whistle Mountain. Came out this year. I love it. A worker placement game where you build the different spots that you place your workers in. You know, you are kind of building a dam, and the way you build stuff when you put out your ships can get you a whole ton of resources. Every game of this plays differently. I really love it. Hmm. This one just missed the People's Choice Top 20 Whistle Mountain, but I think because it's so new. So right. it will probably move up. We'll see. Cool. And I really, really think, Eric, you would like it. Ah, I, will, I will have to try it next time I gain access to the Dice Tower Library. Speaking of people's choice, number 20 for them was Wear Words. Fair Words. Which I considered. I like Wear Words a lot. It's, you know, basically 20 questions with a werewolf. 19, Warsaw City of Ruins. 
about rebuilding the city of Warsaw. 18, Werfel Bonanza. All right. Go figure, Eric. I did not expect that to be on the list. Yeah, I think enough people have ordered it from like Amazon DE and stuff that it's it's uh, showing up. Number 17 is World Without End, a sequel to Pillars of the Earth. Number 16, Winner's Circle. Number 15, Werewolf. Number 14, War Chest. Number 13, Witness. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty high up. Wow. It's a very unique game where you're all whispering into each other's ears. Shouldn't be played right now. No. Number 12, When I Dream. Number 11, World's Fair 1893. A very nice welcoming style game I think highly of. Number 10, Whistle Stop. I like Whistle Stop. I just think Whistle Mountain is much better, um, even though I don't think they're similar either. But Whistle Stop from Bezier Games about crossing trains over the mountain. Number nine, Wizard, that old trick-taking game. Hmm. Number eight, Wavelength. Seven, War of the Ring. Six, Watergate. Five, a game, another game that missed my top ten and made me sad. Welcome to the Dungeon. All right. Ah, such a good little game from Yellow. Number four, Western Legends. Three, Wits and Wagers. Two, the very popular Welcome To. Indeed. Which I thought would be on Eric's list. It came close. That may be my number 11. I, I've only played it a couple times, though, so it, it just wasn't, it's not one that, that stayed on my radar. And my number, and the number one for people is, of course, no contest, Wingspan. Mm-hmm. It is that popular, so. All right, well, that is the best games we played that start with the letter W. We'll be back looking at some games from years, uh, 10 years ago in our next podcast. 2011. Oh, man. Folks, if you've been listening, uh, we've talked in the past. Uh, our One of our 2020 goals was to get our old podcasts and redo them with commentary from me and Joe, the original oh. recorders of them, which is so long ago that these podcasts came out now. I want to say 13, 14 years or something like that. They were recorded on wax cylinders, right? <laughs> uh, it was a scribe recorded them for us. <laughs> it was dictation. And then a troop of actors <laughs> reenacted it. Well, anyway, I don't know when those will come out, but keep an eye on our main channel. They'll be showing up, so don't be surprised when they do. Check out our Kickstarter, DicetowerKickstarter.com. Thank you to everybody for all that you've done for our show. We hope you continue to enjoy it throughout this coming year. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And have a willy, willy great day. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 694, was recorded on January 21st, 2021. Mandy and Suzanne join you next week, and in two weeks, Tom, Mandy, and I travel back a decade with our top 10 games from 2011. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for spreading the word. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with production assistance from Roy Kennedy, Mike Delisio, Chris Yee, and Rob Seary. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Dropping every humorous reference to music, painting, sculpture, and dance, brought to you by Abandon All Artie Jokes. And you can get the latest on everything Dice Tower at Dicetower.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, email us at Tom at Dicetower.com or Eric at Dicetower.com, or follow us on Facebook. And of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including Board Games Insider, Out of Game, The Broken Meeple, The Game Pit, Rolling Dice and Taking Names, The D6 Generation, Ludology, and Board Game Breakfast at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. I, I, I think I have a plan for when we do the X list in about a month. Um, I, I've got Exit. I've got Escape. I've got The Expanse. That's probably cheating, though, isn't it? Uh, all right. You, you, got, you got some time. You got some time to figure that out. Okay. Why? Who would wonder? William Waxus Warp Waspish. Walt would have whacked William well. Wondrous.